And another great day in this greatest nation on God's green earth, a great day to consider the life, death, and legacy of a man considered one of this nation's greatest presidents. In fact, many Americans believe he is the greatest president. In polls of Americans, John Kennedy regularly finishes either first as our very greatest president or second to Abraham Lincoln. In a poll recently in 2010 of the last nine presidents, Kennedy came out by far on top. 85% approval rating. The only one who was even close was Reagan at 74%. Did he deserve that adulation or was it based on some distortions that began during his lifetime? That is something we are going to consider in this very special program, which will feature some of the leading biographers and historians about John Kennedy The program, The Truth About JFK. Everyone is voting for Jack Cause he's got what all the rest lack Everyone wants to back Jack Jack is on the right track Cause he's got high hopes He's got high hopes 1960's the year That, of course, the uh, campaign song for John Kennedy in his uh, presidential campaign of 1960, his only presidential campaign. And uh, it wasn't quite true that everyone was voting for Jack. As a matter of fact, it was one of the closest elections in American history where a switch of a handful of votes could have sent the entire thing the other way. The song, of course, adapted um, by Frank Sinatra from uh, a hit song that had come out recently. Frank Sinatra, a great friend and pal of John Kennedy. But high hope is what President Kennedy was selling. And part of what makes him so enormously popular in uh, the years after his death, he was never as popular when he was alive. But what makes him so enormously popular is a complicated image. It's an image that combines... The reality of an underdog outsider fighting against an establishment, somebody of vigor and energy and health and athleticism, an idealist, a man of great and profound character, and a martyr who died for his country and died for the cause of justice and civil rights. Now, all those things are things that people believe about John Kennedy. All of them, to some extent, are untrue. We're going to consider them in this special broadcast. First of all, the idea that he was an underdog, an upstart, an outsider, a large part of that was based on the idea that he was the first Catholic, the first Irish Catholic ever to be elected for the presidency. The only other Irish Catholic who had run before him was Al Smith, the governor of New York, who was uh, truly from a disadvantaged background. He said he never had a college degree. He had an FFM degree that stood for Fulton Fish Market. That was Al Smith in 1928. But in 1960, when John Kennedy ran, he was about as much an aristocrat and someone with inherited prominence and position as can be imagined. It's true that his great grandfather, not grandfather, great grandfather came to this country in 1848 at the height of the potato famine. And he died young, leaving behind one boy with three older sisters, that boy, P.J. Kennedy, Patrick Joseph Kennedy, had to go to work on the Boston docks and worked and toiled, but he made some money and he bought a tavern and then he bought another tavern. He ended up owning four taverns. He also ended up being one of the most influential politicians in Boston. He was to a very great extent a political boss. He was elected to the state assembly. He was elected to the state legislature and he was well known as a power in democratic politics for all his life. He died when his uh, grandson, John Kennedy, Jack, as he was called, was uh, just 12 years old. His other grandfather was even more famous and even more established in democratic politics. The president's name was John Fitzgerald Kennedy. The original John Fitzgerald was the mayor of Boston. He was elected to the U.S. Congress. He was elected uh, mayor of Boston when he was in the U.S. Congress. Just to give you some sense of how different times were, there were only three Catholics, only three out of 435 members of Congress. So there was a sense of an outsider, even though uh, John Fitzgerald also became a very wealthy guy, like P.J. Kennedy did. And John Fitzgerald, known as Honey Fitz, used to uh, talk a language which was called Fitzblarney. 
a combination of his name, Fitzgerald, and he was called Honey Fitz because of his honeyed voice. He would campaign everywhere singing Sweet Adeline. He apparently had a a gorgeous uh, tenor voice, which people loved. And uh, he was also given, to a certain extent, of scandal. He had a mistress known as Toodles Ryan, who was a cigarette girl in Boston. But he was a great fixture, always popular in the city of Boston, was elected four different times as mayor. And when his grandson, Jack, uh, was elected to Congress right after World War II, Honey Fitz was still alive and he stood up on a tabletop and danced an Irish jig. But the idea that two of the biggest power brokers in Democratic politics, both of them proudly Irish, proudly Catholic in Boston, both of them quite rich, ended up marrying off their two children, that was the union that produced John Kennedy and his famous brothers Bobby and Teddy, Robert and Edward Kennedy. Joseph P. Kennedy, the son of P.J. Kennedy, went to Boston Latin School. He went to Harvard He began making money even when he was a a Harvard undergraduate running a tour company. And he became one of the richest men in America. And he became one of the richest men in America partially by investing in liquor companies. He did that before Prohibition, uh, fortunately for for him initially, but then uh, after Prohibition. And and, and one of the liquor companies he invested in, he bought for $100,000 and then sold a few years later for $8 million. He had a knack for that kind of deal. And Joe Kennedy was involved in everything. He was involved in Hollywood later in life. In fact, he had a longstanding affair with the movie star Gloria Swanson. He um, was involved in Wall Street. He was involved in Democratic politics. He was one of the main contributors to Franklin D. Roosevelt's election campaign in 1932. And he married the princess of Boston, Rose Fitzgerald, the daughter of the mayor, Honey Fitz. She was considered a great beauty. She had studied music and the arts in Europe and Netherlands. Uh, She was cultivated. She was elegant. And uh, maybe because she grew up in her father's home, she was forgiving of some of Joe's foibles. They had nine children. And uh, Jack was the second of those children. He um, was the second boy among the children. He had a whole bunch of older sisters. And the, the story of the Kennedys has been so often told. But... What needs to be acknowledged is that they were fabulously wealthy. The idea that they were ever outsiders. John Kennedy uh, went to prep schools, as his brothers did. He went to a prep school at Choate, and he didn't do particularly well. In fact, he was considered to have uh, psychological problems. He was analyzed for that because he was tested with an IQ of 119, which was pretty good, not off the charts, but he finished uh, slightly below the middle of his class. But still, because of his father's connections, he got into Princeton. He started Princeton because of his bad health. More on that in a moment. He um, he had to quit, then went on to Harvard and did uh, reasonably well. But meanwhile, his father had become a very famous guy and a potential presidential candidate. His father was appointed by Roosevelt who had benefited from Joe Kennedy's very generous campaign contributions, Joe Kennedy had been appointed head of the Security and Exchange Commission, which had been set up to try to patrol Wall Street. And when Frank, President Roosevelt was asked, why did you su- appoint Joe Kennedy, He's such a sleazy operator? Uh, President Roosevelt, it takes a thief to catch a thief. And uh, that's the way he thought of Joe Kennedy. And then he was willing to appoint Joe later in the presidency, to be Secretary of Commerce, but um, but Kennedy, who was dreaming of becoming the first Irish Catholic president, that's Joe Kennedy, the father, uh, wanted to be appointed ambassador to Great Britain. And Roosevelt liked that idea. He didn't want anyone who would be too close to the British. He thought the idea of appointing an Irish ambassador to Britain was uh, a hoot and uh, that Kennedy wouldn't be too close to the British. The, the problem was that Kennedy was one of those people who did not support Roosevelt's support for the Brits in the on-rushing uh, years before World War II. A lot of that has to do with a very well-documented history of anti-Semitism that Joe Kennedy displayed. By the way, there's no evidence that any of his sons inherited that. They always worked very comfortably with Jewish people. Joe Kennedy, even in his Hollywood dealings and his Wall Street dealings elsewhere, didn't like Jewish people at all. Uh, meanwhile, He dreamed of running for president in 1940. 
And he would be running as an America firster, someone who did not want America to get involved in the war, which had begun in 1939. But that dream was shattered when Franklin Roosevelt announced his own campaign. And Joe Kennedy then transferred his dreams for the presidency to his two sons, primarily his oldest son, Joe Jr. What happened next changed uh, history, not just for John Kennedy, but for the nation. We will get to that and more about the truth on JFK coming up. To purchase this special show, The Truth About JFK, go to MedvedHistoryStore.com. On the Michael Medved Show, a very special broadcast, The Truth About JFK. The um, music in the background, Percy Faith playing A Summer Place, a huge hit across the country in 1959, and precisely the kind of music that uh, then-Senator John F. Kennedy particularly enjoyed. It's not true that he loved classical music. He hated it. Jacqueline liked classical music. He liked the music of his pal, Frank Sinatra, and uh, things like Percy Faith. Meanwhile, he wasn't supposed to be the family member who would represent Joe Kennedy Sr.'s dreams of winning the presidency. That was supposed to be his older brother, Joe Jr. Joe Jr. was athletic. He wasn't sickly. John F. Kennedy was always sickly, as we will see. But uh, Joe was athletic. He was enormously popular at Harvard. He had his grandfather, Honey Fitz's charm, and, of course, good looks and political skills. And he was already being talked about as a future president when he died in 1944, In a daring bombing mission, his bomber was filled with munitions and explosives for a special mission against the uh, Germans to knock out some of their supplies that they were using to bomb London. When Joe died, it was devastating for his entire family, but particularly for his father. And um, here is uh, uh, what, what John Kennedy said. He said, one politician was enough in the family, and my brother Joe was obviously going to be that politician. I hadn't considered myself a political type, and he filled all the requirements for political success. But it was Joe Sr., the father, the patriarch, who insisted that Jack take his brother's place. In 57, he said, I got Jack into politics. I was the one. I told him Joe was dead and that it was therefore his responsibility to run for Congress. Uh, Jack remembered it this way to a reporter. It was like being drafted. My father wanted his eldest son in politics. Wanted isn't the right word. He demanded it. You know my father, Jack told a reporter. At the time, when he first ran in 1946, he had had several near-death experiences. He was extraordinarily sick. He came home from the war after his experience with his PT boat being rammed and and having to rescue some members of his crew in the Pacific when he was lieutenant in the the U.S. Navy. He had come home, uh, 6'1", was his height. He weighed 126 pounds. He was emaciated. Lyndon Johnson, uh, who never took Kennedy that seriously, at least until after Kennedy had beaten him for the Democratic nomination, described him as that skinny little kid with rickets. And uh, Kennedy did, in fact, have a great deal of health problems, great many health problems. And this is the second area where the truth about JFK differs from the image. The image was always one of strength and athleticism and vigor. He ran, claiming that he was going to get America moving again. And that was based on the fact that he was 43. Now, he ran against Richard Nixon in 1960. He was only 47 And Nixon was in vastly better health than JFK, had never had the near-death experiences and actually had every bit as much vigor as Kennedy did. But Kennedy used it in his speeches at the end of the first debate with Richard Nixon, first televised debate ever. He concluded his pitch saying if people wanted the status quo, if they wanted a quiet, boring America, basically, they could vote for Nixon. But if they wanted something else, here's what he said. If you feel that we have to move again in the 60s, that the function of the president is to set before the people the unfinished business of our society, as Franklin Roosevelt did in the 30s, the agenda for our people, what we must do as a society 
to meet our needs in this country and protect our security and help the cause of freedom. Well, then you had to vote for John Kennedy. Uh, Hollywood collaborated with this image of a strong, heroic, uh, robust president. And uh, how? Well, during his presidency, while the president was still very much alive and not hugely popular, he was popular, but he knew that he was going to have a tough fight for re-election. But certainly it would have helped that the year before he ran for re-election, Warner Brothers announced this film project. Warner Brothers, for three years, has been engaged in bringing to the screen one of the most important adventures ever filmed. On the high seas, in tropical locations, cameras rolled on the big excitement of this famous personal story. And the story of which every American can feel proud. The young man I play is a fellow from Boston. His name, Lieutenant John F. Kennedy. Can you... His boat, PT-109. <laughs> And that was the name of the film. I mean, <laughs> pure propaganda uh, promoting John Kennedy. And can you imagine if they came out, even today, Hollywood, which is obviously very besotted with Barack Obama, they, they I think, would not make a heroic movie about his work as a community organizer. But see, this was all part of emphasizing what a remarkable physical specimen Kennedy was supposed to be. People knew he had a bad back. But the nation was told, and I remember this as a kid, he had hurt his back during PT-109. He had hurt it playing football. He didn't. He had a bad back from the time he was a child. He had Addison's disease. Uh, They have made lists of the unhealthiest presidents, and Kennedy is either at the top or near the top, along with Grover Cleveland. He's always right up there. Here are some of the maladies from which he suffered. Scarlet fever, measles, swooping cough. Kennedy's childhood was riddled with health issues. At two years old, he contracted measles, whooping cough, and chicken pox. He also contracted scarlet fever, which almost killed him. Later in childhood, he frequently had upper respiratory infections and bronchitis, as well as allergies, frequent colds, asthma, diarrhea, colitis, and a weak stomach. Later, jaundice, pneumonia, appendicitis. During his teen years, Kennedy had his appendix removed, suffered a severe case of pneumonia, had his tonsils removed, and was ill with jaundice twice, which sent him to the hospital for two months and forced him to withdraw from Princeton which it's where he had originally gone. He also suffered from urethritis. Once Kennedy recovered from jaundice, he resumed his college education at Harvard. During this time, he contracted urethritis, an inflammation of the urethra that results in painful urination. Uh, People who knew him used to hear him expressing pain with urination. Kennedy didn't seek immediate treatment, so this became a chronic, chronic problem for many years, despite his taking drugs to suppress symptoms. Finally, after he got elected to the U.S. Senate, in 1952, right after he got elected to the Senate, right after he got married to Jacqueline, he uh, decided that he had to do something about his back. And so he was going to do very risky back surgery, spinal fusion surgery. This basically took him out of the Senate for months and months. It's uh, Most of the doctors um, uh, did not want to go forward. And his father said, you don't have to, because even if you're disabled, Franklin Roosevelt had proven that disability was not incompatible with uh, political success. But JSK found a willing surgeon and endocrinologist in New York. Bone was grafted, a metal plate inserted, steroids given continuously throughout a three-hour operation. Kennedy took steroids every day. He also had injections of procaine, which is similar to cocaine and has similar effects took testosterone and a bouquet, a, uh, a banquet of other drugs. A Kennedy survival, the uh, story of the back surgery is crucial for understanding part of the truth about JFK. You're listening to The Truth About JFK on The Michael Medved Show. The smash hit song Tequila, which came out in 1959, just as John Kennedy was planning his presidential campaign. That was three years after his vice presidential campaign. He had tried hard to win the vice presidential nomination for the Democratic Party in 1956. It's probably lucky that he didn't win because the ticket went down to defeat to President Eisenhower that year. But one of the things that happened at the... uh, the Democratic convention was the New York Post was getting ready to run a story about Kennedy's Addison's disease because he had had this long hospitalization and near-death experiences and 
In fact, it's amazing. Between 1953 and 1957, uh, and he was in the Senate that entire period, John Kennedy had seven hospitalizations, uh, mostly at uh, GWU, uh, George Washington University in Washington, or at New York Hospital, generally for short stays of a few days, usually caused by various infections, either in the urinary tract, ear, or throat, followed by Addison's disease, crisis syndromes of fever, malaise, and altered mental states. Um, And he would have to get intravenous anabolic uh, steroids and other injections. Uh, He was a wreck, and really a wreck. When uh, he told the New York Post in 1956, don't run this story, it will ruin my chances of the vice presidency, they killed the story. And people had no idea at the time that he was president of the United States and a United States senator, uh, the level of his illness. This is well described in Robert Dalek's book. We'll be speaking to Professor Dalek a little bit later in this program. His, uh, his book, uh, An Unfinished Life, a biography of Kennedy. Uh, but it's also described by Dr. Nasser Gemi. He's a physician, a psychiatrist. He wrote a book called A First Rate Madness, Uncovering the Links Between Leadership and Mental Illness. And he talks a little bit about Kennedy's experience in 1953, right after he got married, right after he came to the U.S. Senate, won a challenging um, a Senate race. He talks about his decision to have spinal fusion surgery. Very risky. And against his father's advice and the doctor's advice, there were many implications, complications. As expected, his immune-compromised condition led to serious infection of the surgical wound within three days. The Addisonian crisis came. He fell into an altered mental state, and this time heavy doses of steroids did not perk him up. He went into a full coma. The last rites of the Catholic Church were administered. His father and his new wife, Jackie, watched helplessly. And his secretary, Evelyn Lincoln, recalled that she was working away at his Senate office, which was right across the hall from the office of Vice President Richard Nixon. And Nixon raced into Kennedy's office with, quote, an odd look on his face, wanting to know if the reports were true, that her boss lay mortally ill. That poor young man is going to die. Secret Service agent Rex Scouton recalled Nixon saying on his way home one evening, his eyes filling with tears, poor brave Jack is going to die. Oh, God, oh, God, don't let him die. The intravenous steroids were increased, and a few days later he woke up. He was in the hospital for two months, solid. He's a U.S. senator, and it's kept quiet. It was worse, it was worse when he came out than he'd been when he came in. The back pain persisted. The metal plate, plate, Dr. Gemi writes, continually infected, was soon removed. An open hole in his back large enough to fit a man's fist up to the wrist drained pus for six months. Every night, his new wife would clean the open wound. For over seven months, the newly elected senator was laid up. JFK was devastated, suggesting the presence of severe depression. A friend later recalled, We came close to losing him. I don't mean just losing his life. I mean losing him as a person. Now, with with all of this going on, after he became president, he emphasized physical fitness. His brother, Bobby, who was a much better health, uh, went on 50-mile hikes. And people didn't know that President Kennedy, before press conferences, he would take eight, eight painful injections into his back of procaine, which would help get him up to do his press conferences. He, he took whole cocktails of drugs and, and uh, stimulants and am, amphetamines and more. He also had special injections. He didn't even know what was in them from Dr. Max Jacobs and Dr. Feelgood, who was later busted. He lost his medical license because he treated New York celebrities with mood-altering drugs. And in fact, during the presidential campaign, uh, the, one of the scariest moments for John Kennedy was when his bag of meds disappeared. It was not because he wasn't worried that he couldn't find other meds. It was he worried it would fall into the wrong hands. There was also a break-in twice at doctor's offices looking for his medical records, given the fact that he was running against Richard Nixon, who uh, later got involved in something called Watergate. It's amazing that Nixon never found out or never used the information. More about the startling truth about JFK. Coming up. To purchase this special show, go to medvidhistorystore.com. She sighs when you're feeling like the toy on a string. 
And your heart goes ring-a-ding, ding, ring-a-ding, ding, ring-a-ding, ding. And it's true that for many Americans, uh, their hearts went ring-a-ding, ding for John F. Kennedy. But that didn't prevent him from underperforming in the election of 1960. This is one of the many, many things that people misunderstand about Jack Kennedy in this uh, very special broadcast where we're going to be joined by some of the leading historians of the new frontier, some of them great admirers of President Kennedy, as I was when I was a boy, when I was in eighth grade, I actually cut school to line up for a rally that President Kennedy did the very end of the campaign at Horton Plaza in San Diego where I was growing up. And I was 10 feet away from him, reached up, touched him. And uh, he was my hero at the time. President Kennedy was a lot of people's hero, but he was expected, according to most polls and according to his own campaign's polls, to win between 53 and 57 percent of the vote when he ran for president against Richard Nixon in 1960. Uh, He didn't. He ended up with 49.72% of the vote, below 50%. Incredibly close election. In the state of Hawaii, which was voting for the presidency for the first time, he he won the state by 115 votes, 0.06% margin. In New Jersey, it was 0.8% margin. And, of course, in Illinois and Texas, there were voting irregularities that some Republicans still believe, I think wrongly, Kennedy won the election, but there were irregularities in Illinois. Even if he had lost Illinois, as long as he carried Texas, which is why he picked Lyndon Johnson, he would have been elected president. He was not the underdog outsider. He should have been the heavy favorite to win the election. He was not a picture of vigor and health. He was a physical wreck and lied about it a great deal. Nor was he an idealist who was identified with all kinds of new and bold and daring ideals, despite the fact that his rhetoric might lead you to believe that. Here he is accepting the Democratic nomination for president after the convention in Los Angeles, speaking in the Coliseum to a roaring crowd, giving one of the most famous speeches of his career. And we stand today on the edge of a new frontier, the frontier of the 1960s, the frontier of unknown opportunities and perils, the frontier of unfilled hopes and unfilled threats. But the new frontier of which I speak is not a set of promises. It is a set of challenges. It sums up not what I intend to offer to the American people, but what I intend to ask of them. It appeals to their pride. It appeals to our pride, not our security. It holds out the promise of more sacrifice instead of more security. Okay, this is similar to uh, ask not what your country can do for you. But what is he really talking about? The Democratic platform in 1960 was not spectacularly idealistic. Idealists in that campaign on the Democratic side tended to be for Adlai Stevenson or Hubert Humphrey, who was much more unapologetically liberal. John Kennedy was seen as a pragmatist, even an opportunist. He was somebody who missed the vote. He was the only Democrat in the Senate who didn't vote to condemn Joseph McCarthy, uh, partially because McCarthy was a family friend, uh, going back to Joe Kennedy, but but also because he was in the hospital at the time. Uh, That was, um, Eleanor Roosevelt said about that, he had written a book, a Pulitzer Prize winning book called Profiles in Courage, actually written by Ted Sorensen, his aide. And she said, I wish Senator Kennedy had shown more courage and less profile. But uh, President Kennedy came to office claiming, uh, as a, as a um, campaign promise, more defense spending, seeking agreements on arms control, support generally for civil rights, but nothing in particular, more aid to undeveloped nations, medical insurance for the elderly, increased uh, med- medical research on cancer, disability insurance, conservation of natural resources, slum clearance, an acceleration of the space program and limitations on campaign contributions and expenditures, which is easy when you're one of the richest guys in America. He got a million dollars when he was 21 from his trust fund. Look, all of this went to the idea of a privileged princeling who ended up acceding to the presidency without any real agenda. And uh, that's part of the reason that the first couple of years of his presidency, he was buffeted by foreign crises. 
handled the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, of course, very well, keeping the world from blowing itself up. But a lot of historians would say that he was responsible for getting into us into that crisis in the first place. And there was another crisis that didn't happen, which was the crisis of John Kennedy's exposure. Exposure for what? Exposure for his sexual adventurism. And this goes to the idea of President Kennedy's character and judgment. And the most uh, disturbing book on this is, is written by a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter named Seymour Hirsch, who's very much a liberal and did grow up as a Kennedy admirer. He wrote a book called The Dark Side of Camelot. And he writes that Bobby Kennedy, who was, of course, the president's chief aide, his attorney general and closest confidant, knew, as did many of the men and women in the White House, that Jack Kennedy had been living a public lie as the attentive husband of Jacqueline, the glamorous and high-profile first lady. In private, Kennedy was consumed with almost daily sexual liaisons and libertine partying to a degree that shocked many members of his personal Secret Service detail. Hirsch interviewed them, and by name, they're on the record. The sheer number of Kennedy's sexual partners and the recklessness of his use of them escalated throughout his presidency. The women sometimes paid prostitutes located by his friend Dave Powers and other members of the so-called Irish Mafia who embraced and protected the president, would be brought to Kennedy's office or his private quarters without any prior Secret Service knowledge or clearance. Seventy to 80 percent of the agents thought it was just nuts, recalled Tony Sherman, a former member of Kennedy's White House Secret Service detail, in a 1995 interview. Suddenly, I'm Joe Agent here. I'm looking at the president of the United States and telling myself, this is the White House and we protect the White House. Another Secret Service agent had the unceremonious chore of bringing sexually explicit photographs of a naked president with various paramours to the Mickelson Gallery, which was one of most uh, Washington's most prestigious art galleries. They bring these naked photos showing the president, sometimes with two women at once, naked people lying on beds. They bring them every day to the gallery, and the gallery owner confirmed it, and had, they would be framed and sent back to the White House. And yes, people heard about Lee Remick and Marilyn Monroe and Angie Dickinson and movie stars and about the two White House secretaries named Fiddle and Faddle. There's also a 19-year-old intern who has told the story of Kennedy deflowering her on his wife's bed. A man of great character? We'll get to that and more on this special broadcast, The Truth About JFK. This is the great music to Oliver Stone's not great film, JFK, which uh, music written by John Williams. The film JFK did as much as anything to confirm uh, John Kennedy's status as a martyr. What was he a martyr to? Uh, Well, the idea was he was a martyr to the cause of civil rights. Now, that's odd because he didn't even attend the March on Washington, uh, didn't give it vocal support. He um, he was very reluctant on the cause of civil rights, very pragmatic and very political. The um, the the problem is that right after he died, uh, James Reston, who was chief, chief political correspondent for The New York Times, did a front page column the day after the assassination and said, why America weeps Kennedy, a victim of violent streak. He sought to curb a nation and Chief Justice Earl Warren, who was later head, of course, of the commission investigating the assassination, blamed bigots for the assassination And uh, Drew Pearson, who's a syndicated newspaper columnist, said Kennedy was the victim of a hate drive. Some of this continues to this day. People say it's that hateful climate in Dallas. The, The truth of the matter is that Lee Harvey Oswald was a communist and he was eager to go back to Cuba. He had gone to Russia. He hated America. He posed with communist literature. He previously had tried to shoot the local head of the John Birch Society in Dallas. He wasn't part of the right wing cabal in in Dallas at all. And the the nonsense about a massive conspiracy tries to confirm this idea of John Kennedy as some martyr to a cause. Now, this is something that Lyndon Johnson used and James Pearson, who has a, a fine new book. And uh, it's a book called Camelot and the Cultural Revolution, How the Assassination of John F. Kennedy Shattered American Liberalism. But he talks about the use of Kennedy as a martyr. Uh, John Kennedy had died, Johnson said, but his cause was not really clear. I had to take the dead man's program and turn it into a martyr's cause. And that's what he did on the behalf of civil rights. And Johnson also uh, did not want the knowledge of, of Oswald's real motivations, the fact that he was a communist, to be known because that would complicate relations with Cuba and uh, with the Soviet Union at the time. It was much more convenient 
And certainly the Kennedy family wanted that. One of the reasons that there are so many unanswered questions about JFK is not because the Kennedy family cleared out records of the assassination. It's because they cleared out records of not the way Kennedy died, but the way he lived, particularly the, the, the sexual indulgence, which Jacqueline Kennedy apparently knew about. We will be speaking about that with some of uh, Kennedy's biographers. The man was extraordinary. He did have an extraordinary charisma. He could touch um, a young eighth grader. I, I became obsessed with Kennedy. I was, I was 11 years old. Is that right? Yeah, I was. And uh, this is some of the hold that he had on the baby boom generation. But to try to understand what the administration was really about, substantively and stylistically and culturally, it's worth knowing the truth about JFK in this greatest nation on God's green earth.